So welcome to the Sport in History podcast, brought to you by the British Society of Sport History in association with the Institute for Historical Research. This week it's my pleasure to talk to Nigel Hancock about the work of the Cricket Society. Hi Nigel. Hi Jeff, great to be here in central London. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Nigel is the chair of the Cricket Society, which is a well-regarded member organisation which exists to promote cricket in all its spheres, that is listening, reading, watching and playing. In particular, the Society has published a regular journal and bulletin. Uh, it puts on live meetings with cricketers and the people who write about them. It makes awards, it runs lunches and other events and has its own cricket team. And Nigel's here to talk to us about an exciting new initiative which will bring together the BSSH and the Cricket Society, as well as to talk more generally about the Society and the benefits that it offers its members. I should also offer full disclosure that I was recently brought onto the executive of the Society as committee secretary, so this is by no means the first time that Nigel and I have met. Um, so Nigel, how did you come to be chair of the Society? That could be a long story, Jeff. Right. I, I, I double checked last night, it was eight years ago now. I was on a longboat uh, holiday up in Wales some, somewhere and I missed the committee meeting and they appointed me in my absence. <laughs> but of course I had agreed in advance to, uh, to join. I joined the Cricket S Society which was founded in 1945 and I think we'll be coming on to, to, to that. Um, while I was working in in London, I, I had a career in the civil service working for the Home Office and Ministry of Justice and they had meetings uh, up near Green Park and I used to go along after a day's work and, and, and listen. But I, I was a lapsed me member, but they were advertising for someone to run a book competition, their mm. book of the year competition. So that was before I became chairman. So I did that a couple of years before, before that. That's uh, quite a prestigious event now that we do in partnership with M M C MCC. But um, eight years ago, I joined the Cricket Society chair as, as, as the chairman. So um, I've been doing it that that long. Yeah, and the book, uh, the award, is really prestigious. And I'm um, glad to say that one year, a book I was involved with um, was shortlisted, and it was a really nice evening at Lords where they. Uh, Which book was that? It was a book about South Africa and empire, so empire oh, yes. and cricket, and it was a, like a multi-authored um, thing. Yes. So I had a very small part in it. Um, but it was great hospitality by the Society and MCC for the awards evening. Have you drawn up a shortlist for this year's award? Yes, and we've uh, we've we've announced it. Oh, okay. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> Maybe you could give out. And Prashant, Prashant Kidambi is on this is on the shortlist. I know oh, okay. he's speaking at your conference. That's in, right. Yeah, in yeah. August, and um, I think he's keen to do something with us with us, with, with us as well. So there are there are several books on six books on the shortlist, including yeah. uh, one by Vic. Vic, Vic, Vic Marks, um, Duncan Hamilton wrote a, a very good Who's book won about previously, about I think, hasn't he, Duncan Hamilton? Yes, he has. He has. Yeah. He's just done a book about Neville, Neville Carders, which got a lot of good, good reviews and has won some other um, yeah. um, awards. Um, Chris. Christopher Samford, who's a well-known um, biogra biographist, has also uh, got a book, a book up there. Um, and a couple of others. We would normally have had the event by now, mm. but I think it's going to be a, a Zoomed event later in the year. But MCC staff are still furloughed, not back till September. Ah, OK. So it's a, a bit long in the, in the planning. But we'll have it there. And what I'd really like to do is to have a part real, part streamed event, perhaps get the um, shortlisted authors there and their, and their publishers and a, and a few others, but live, live streamers as, as well. Uh, the one you mentioned earlier when the South African book, that yeah. was uh, a really good evening uh, and I remember they'd come in from South Af Af Africa, we, we'd yeah. had a shortlisted author come in from uh, Australia, from from, uh, from New York and it was, a, it was a really, really good evening. We got a lot of publicity yeah. Uh, yeah. Ar around that which helps the profile of the the Cricket Society. Yeah, it was a really um, special evening that I remember. And you mentioned that the Society goes back to 1945, so that means that this is quite a special year for the Society. It's, uh, yeah, I think you can read too much into anniversaries. I mean, historians look at decades, etc. Why not start in 1923 rather than 1920? And, yeah. uh, um, I'm having to rationalise that because of the current public health uh, crisis. But yes, the Cricket Society was founded in 1945, just after the war. It followed um, correspondence in the Cricketer, the, mm. cr in the main cricket magazine, which started in about 1921, I think. So it was cricket enthusiasts getting together 
after, after the war. They were mostly statistical at first, and it was called the Society of um, the Society of Cricket Statisticians. Yeah. Um, but it changed its name three years later and became the Cricket Society, and it remains the Cricket Society. It was the first Cricket Society. There are uh, about 30, 40 other Cricket Societies in, in, in the UK, yeah. uh, and others in Australia, uh, in Zimbabwe, other parts of the world mostly where cricket has been been played but we're the we're the biggest and the best and the, f uh, <laughs> and the first so we get to celebrate our anniversaries ahead of everybody else but 75 75 uh, th th this year but why not why not recommend why not celebrate 76 or or some should celebrate every year that cricket's played shouldn't we <laughs> it's, it's a good it's a good it's a good yeah. it's a good excuse yeah of course it's been a very difficult year for cricket with the lockdown and similarly for the society because I know that um, one of the important things for society is bringing members together for live events. Um, how have you been managing to run those events uh, during the lockdown? Well, it's, it's fortuitous in, in that we don't normally have member meetings during the summer because mm. um, we assume our members are watching cricket yeah. <laughs> uh, live. Um, although in recent years we have had uh, days at the cricket and so we were going to have a, a day at uh, uh, a women's, a women's OD, ODI, your Chairman, your mm. chair, Ralph Nicholson, was leading for us on, on that, and and, and and another one. We have two of these each each year now. Um, in, and in Ashes years, last year we had a reception with a film night with David Frith right. um, in South London near Waterloo, um, as a reception, but also, but also as a film night. So we so increasingly we have done some summer summer events. We don't normally have normal e events where um, we have a speaker. And, questions etc et so in a way we've been providing better quality of service to our members because we've just had the second of a series of zoomed uh, meetings mm. our president John Barclay um, was in conversation with Stephen Chalk who's a well-known cricket mm. cricket writer and that was good and last Friday I took the plunge myself and interviewed uh, Vic, Vic Marks um, okay. and we had uh, over a hundred hundred there I keep an eye on those Figures because uh, well, I, I don't want to be <laughs> thinking that I'm talking to an empty, empty space. It's, it's good to know that yeah. there's, there's a market for it. And what was really interesting was that a third of those, because we use the poll, polling, polling feature, a third of those hadn't been to meetings in London. We have other locations in Bath, in Chester Street, and in the West Midlands at Edgbaston. Mm. Edgbaston. So about a third of them don't normally go to a, go to our meetings and there was one guy who um, um, hadn't been to one meeting for 20 25 years right. I think he would think he was bedridden ridden and he'd obviously made his made his day and he was looking forward to the, to the next one so we're encouraged whatever happens with um, practical meetings and one of the things I'm doing this week while I'm in in London is, is going to, to the Union Jack Club where we're we'll doing a risk assessment on mm. can we realistically put on on, 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 me, on meetings is to have a series of Zoom meetings throughout throughout the year, and the next one um, involves Raf yeah. again, who is yeah. interviewing uh, Charlotte Charlotte yeah. Edwards, and we're making that available to a wider wider grouping. As while we were still experimenting, we kept it just to just to members, although people's friends obviously join in and. I, I sent it to you know to one or two people to get the numbers up. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> of course, but this one we're going to advertise more um, across the academic community. Uh, uh, trying to tr we're trying to attract more women. We're trying to focus more on women's 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 cricket. Um, I mentioned the day at a women's ODI that we that, that we'd planned. So that that's coming up on the thirteenth of. August and Eventbrite is, is, is there for anyone who wants to, yeah. to to join and for anyone who wants to join the Cricket Society well, well I'll give the website address at the at the end you'll probably prompt me yeah I mean that's one of the things that we've noticed we ran a BSSH and British Library event on zoom uh, a little while ago and you, you get a real global reach with these events and so yes. um, I think it's really positive that the Cricket Society has embraced the technology. Sometimes cricket can be seen as a fairly conservative organisation um, but I can see that the Cricket Society, even since I've joined, which is a six months or a year ago now, that, that you're really trying to push forward 
bring in the women's game, give much yes. more coverage to the women's game, but also try and reach out to new members and younger membership and things like this. I think it's, it's a very positive development. Yeah. Yeah. An interesting thing we've found last week is, is um, people in cricket will always tell funny stories. They'll get, they'll get, they'll get laughed. If you've muted all your, all your people, they can't actually hear and, and, and respond. And um, I'm a bit ambiguous about the, the, the noise that you can choose to have at <laughs> premiership matches and the test, the test match yeah, the the noises. But perhaps yeah. we need some, some canned uh, <laughs> laughter to encourage our, our, our contributors. You think chairs should have a button they can press <laughs> at the appropriate moment? I think it could be interesting. I'm sure we'll develop yeah. the art, the art uh, in the course of the next year or, or so. But I think, I think, I think it's here to, say, to stay. Um, our members tend to be. Um, of the older variety, some of them, and say in central London, mm. people are probably quite happy to come to venues, but it's the travel, yeah. travel there, yeah, there yeah. and there and back that, that troubles uh, a more elderly audience in particular, but not just the elderly, anybody. We all have to take our own decisions on what to do during these uh, unprecedented times. Yeah, it's a very fluid situation, isn't it? So um, in six months' time, we could be back where we were in March, or we could be liberated. And uh, But I think one thing that is here to stay is the use of uh, Zoom and similar technologies, isn't it, to kind of increase the reach of these kinds of meetings. Yes, and a hi the hybrid one, where if you, can, if you can only have 30 people at a meeting, but you can live stream it mm. simultaneously, that's yeah. one of the things we're checking this this week with the Union Union Jack Club. If you can do that, then in a way you're satisfying um, you most got the people. Both worlds, most, most, most people. But we did also polled because we weren't sure about the viability of people. It's one thing putting meetings on, real meetings on. It's another getting audience there. But yeah. we think sufficient people would come to Central London to justify our resuming meetings when we can even if that's not until next year as may well be the yeah. case well I'll be there <laughs> um, you've, I've heard that you uh, you've written um, some cricket history yourself um, in particular about some cricket crowns uh, what's your yes, academic background yeah, yeah well my um, my PhD supervisors at De Montfort would uh, oh, okay. smile, smile ruefully when you were talking about <laughs> my my writing because they they likened me to some character in Middlemarch who, who flattered but to deceive in terms of producing <laughs> text. I've got a perfect PhD thesis ready to be written but I, right. think I may need another another life. I, I did history and politics at University of Lancaster a, a lifetime yeah. a lifetime ago and I went on to do uh, a master's in Soviet government and politics. I had to learn a bit of, Ru of Russian for, oh, okay. to, to do that and um, in my working life I spent a lot of time working in prison, prison, poli prison policy in, in the Ministry of Justice and earlier the, the, home, the home Office. And I did a, a, an MSc at Cambridge in Applied Criminology and Management, which it wasn't quite as grand as it, as, as it appears. I think we had to be there for 12 weeks over two years, but it's great being a student again. Yeah. Um, I retired 10 years ago now and I was going to do some consultancy work but I never actually got got round to that inside decided I'm going to follow my sporting interests I was already heavily involved with the cricket society um, and I thought oh, I'll do something academic on on cricket because cricket more than any other sport that I'm really aware of has got a vast a vast literature the yeah. length of time you are at cricket nurtures nurtures that and some great great writers yeah. contributed to cricket to cricket pros so uh less is my home hometown and i registered there at de montfort for a, for, a, for a phd pierce reynolds your treasurer yeah. was there at the time he's he's a lapsed P uh, phd yeah. phd student yeah. as, as well so i'm in good good company i think when we talk about partnerships between the cricket society and uh, BSSH. So I was interested in the, in, in the cricket crowd, in the cricket crowd, which um, Richard Cashman in Australia, have a go you mug. Yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and other works, he, he wrote about Indian cricket crowds and the comparison internationally between different cricket crowds and how they reflect society and culture, I think is, is, a, subject, is a subject in itself. No one has really um, academically has, has written a thesis or, or a book, a, a big thesis about um, the history of the English cricket crowd, and that's what that, that's that, that's what interested 
yeah. in May. It was, I think I was always a bit toyed, uh, torn between the historical and the sociological so the, yeah, side, because yeah. there's a rich sociological history around sporting uh, crowds from Alan Gutman um, yeah. and, and, others, and others onwards. And I did quite a bit of research with, with a cohort of people who um, had followed cricket from, in some cases, just before the war or, or, or during the war, particularly in the 1940s and, yeah. and 50s. So I interviewed quite a few people and I've still got that data yeah. data store. It's a question of balancing that and, and the history. And I kept get, getting, I suppose, sidelined by, by particular interests with, with, within it. So I decided in the end, um, partly for family and personal reasons, to carry on with my, with my interests. So I was a member of uh, your organisation for a long time. I've recently uh, rejoined because I realised yeah. I wasn't getting the magazines anymore. I thought, oh yes, it must be something to do about paying paying money. I've been to two or three of the conferen conferences uh, that, that you've had and interesting other, other events. I went a couple of years ago to a seminar in um, Oxford, which was, which was very, very interesting too. So I've kept a foot in the academic Door, yeah. and I greatly enjoyed the, the friendships and relationships with, 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 with academics. While I was working, I, I did uh, commission a lot of research from Cambridge Institute of Criminology. So I was used to commissioning re research and, and trying to act on it in the policies I was involved in with ministers and the, uh, and the prison service. I thought I'd perhaps better do a bit, a bit, a bit more research, but um, it's, yeah. it's on the back burner. Right. Well, it's, uh, I think it's a story that many people who have undertaken PhDs will recognise that um, it's a, it can be laborious, <laughs> um, it can be fascinating. Yes. You can also get s slightly obsessed by certain aspects and less interested in, in others and the writing up is the hardest part, I think. So. It, it is. I think if, if the lockdown continues and it, it comes back, I've got all my stuff now in, uh, well, I live partly in Leicester, partly in Evesham, I've got most of my stuff in in Evesham and I might try and write a, a, a book or a short book or or, or, um, yeah. or something like that because there's a lot of work that I can resuscitate and, uh, and draw on. Who, who was your supervisor at De Montfort? Tony Collins. Oh right, okay. Yeah, so one yeah. of the best. Uh, yes. He's shortlisted uh, for the BSSH Book of the Year prize this year I think for uh, again, his book about the origins of um, of uh, football, yeah, around the world. Yeah, he's been shortlisted and, and won several times, I think, two or three times from memory. Prolific, uh, prolific, <laughs> prolific writer. writer. Rug rugby yeah. Union. Yeah, the, Rugby Union, Rugby the, League. The schism between Rugby Union yeah. and... Um, that r reminds me that I said earlier that the Cricket Society started out from a statistical <laughs> base and there was, there was a bit of schism there, not on the rugby, rug, rug, rugby levels, <laughs> but um, there's something called the Association of Cricket um, statisticians and historians, I think it's called, which was a sort of offshoot from 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 from, 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 the, from those times. Whereas the Cricket Society is more is more mainstream. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't, if, it, if it had statistics in the name, I don't think I'd be a member. I certainly wouldn't be chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mentioned earlier on that the society and the BSSH are collaborating on, on an exciting new initiative, which is yes. the Howard Milton Award. Yes. Um, so for those who don't know, and I didn't, <laughs> who, who, is, uh, who is Howard Milton? Well, if you Google the name, as I did last night, just to check, you, you, you get a painter and an, an executive <laughs> head chef. chef, chef. Uh, I don't think he's either of those unless he's uh, multitasked in a way that, that, that he hadn't. He, he's, he was um, a Ministry of Defence librarian, and he was in parallel to, to that, and until five years ago, he was the Cricket Society lab librarian. We sold off the, the Crown Jewels last, last year mm. with two auctions at, at Knights, the sports or, or auctions. But Howard was our librarian for 40 years. He um, is, a man of, is a man of Kent, and effectively is, a, is the Kent cricket historian and, mm. and, and statistician. He's, he's got a book out, which is uh, written with somebody else about Kent cricket grounds, which has been nominated for our Book of the Year award for 2021. Oh, okay. So we've yeah. not had the 2020 ceremony yet, but we've already started on 2021. Possibly we might merge them, but I haven't seen that book. Mm. But um, but he's there. He was a significant figure in the Cricket Society's 
history and when we were looking for a name his seemed as good as any. I think lots of researchers will be happy to have an award named after a librarian because they're the people who help us to get the stuff, sometimes they don't but more, more usually in my experience librarians are fantastic people and uh, it's a good, good idea to recognise uh, yeah, their value they do, to the historical They do the spade work without getting the honours always, yeah, yes. Yeah, um, and so what's the thinking behind the award? So? Well, it's I mean, from my point of view and the society's point of view, it, and people who, who knew me when I was more active at the Montfort will probably remember this, I think that there, is, there are unnecessary gulfs between academic sports writing and popular sports, mm. sports writing. Um, academic, I can understand the reasons, but you can go to, to academic seminars or whatever and there's well advertised, top speakers, and there's probably about six people around Round, round, round the table. Yeah, <laughs> sounds familiar. <laughs> but a lot of good, accessible work is written. Some is more accessible than others, um, but a lot, lot is accessible, and I think that deserves to, to go before a wider audience. Conversely, I think there are probably a lot of people who write good, popular, if I can use that term, cricket books and other, and other sport, sport books who develop a lot of skills, their research uh, methods are probably quite sound and they don't quite get the recognition that they, that they do. So the idea of awarding, um, I think we've said to a person or persons who have made an outstanding and or unsung contribution to cricket scholarship mm. would sweep up people in both those, those camps. And I know that we've got to have a, a, a final meeting to decide on the winners in the first two years for this year and next year with the idea of um, perhaps a popular winner one year and an academic uh, one year, but I don't really like to use those phrases. No, it's, about cricket, it's about cricket scholarship yeah. and cricket, cricket writing. And if we can bring together more the people who write these and the, and the communities who, who, who follow them, I think we can get some very good discussions going. I think uh, I'm, I'm entirely behind that sentiment. I mean, it's often a debate that's had um, on the academic side is um, about how uh, how we can make our own writing more publicly accessible, um, while also keeping the academic res respectability. I suppose as people feel, academic historians sometimes feel there's a trade-off between popularity and scholarship. Whereas I, I completely agree with you that there are some academics who are not great scholars, to be honest, <laughs> and I'm not going to name any names. Um, and there are popular writers who don't get the credit that they deserve for the phenomenal research that they do. Somebody I would pick out would be someone like Simon Wilde, whose work I used quite a lot for my own PhD when I was talking about yeah. CB Fry. Um, I wasn't going to go and research the complete life of CB Fry for one chapter of a PhD, so I'm happy to say that I've relied on Simon Wilde's scholarship for, for the nuts and bolts of that. It just depends what what interpretation you put on the, on the on the events that he's found out. So I think it's a it's a really good award and I'm very, very happy that, that you asked me to be on the panel to, to try and unearth uh, some good candidates, of which there are many, I think, and we should be announcing the shortlist very soon, as you said. Um, but to go back to the Cricket Society, mm. so if people want to know more about the Society, where can they go? We can go to cricketsociety.com. Cricketsociety.com is our, is our website. Um, and there's some information there. There's a members section there, so it's a good idea to become a member. It's only £21 a year That's to be a, a member of the Cricket Society. <laughs> yeah. um, and we have two journals a year, which I, which I, I edit, uh, and there are eight, eight bulletins which come more, more, frequent, frequent, become more frequently. Um, so I'm afraid you have to print a form off. We are, I hope, in the next uh, year or so, going to modernise um, our website and introduce payments on online. But yeah. for the moment, please bear bear with us. But um, but look look there, and you and you will see. And if Hipsters anyone might enjoy that old school approach. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You can. It's the, it's the, you can write a check yeah. and post it. Um, yeah. It's the equivalent of having a turntable in uh, in your Shoreditch loft, isn't it? We do have direct debits. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I definitely encourage people to go there. I mean, I've been a member for yeah, like I said, six months or so. The journal's very high quality. Some very good book reviews in there and good articles about cricket history and then the bulletin 
um, actually contains a lot of um, news and information and writing as well. So I think you, you do get a lot of value for money plus the plus the live events that you put on with really yeah. top yeah. sportsmen and authors. Yeah, and I think partnerships, we've touched on partnerships, mm. partnerships between organisations are, are crucial to the survival and, and flourishing of, of organisations. When the Cricket Society was formed in 1945, it was a big, it was a big fish in a smaller pool. Now mm. it's a, still a fish, but the pool is very much bigger, um, and the collaborations, the partnerships we have with um, MCC, with Chance to Shine, we have a charitable arm, the Cricket mm. Society um, Trust, um, which helps us raise, we help them raise funds, but that helps us as well. For example, we're, we're having a new Christmas card, mm. which uh, is, is, a, is a new, uh, with an outside company, and the, and the trust is involved in, in, in that. I think the more partnerships that organisations have, including academic ones, it makes them less inward looking, more outward looking, and more sustainable in the longer term. Yeah, I think that's a perfect way to. Uh to sum up the interview because it really is the, the purpose of us talking to each other and then the award that we're collaborating on and then the various events that are going on. So thanks for coming into London today. This is the first live interview I've done since before the lockdown so it's really uh, it's been really enjoyable to not talk to somebody through a screen so thanks for coming down to London and uh, it's still not too late to participate in the BSSH's virtual conference which takes place at the end of this month. August 2020. I think that registration is closing this week, so um, people who want to go, go along to that can register via the BSSH website at sportsinhistory.org, or you can tweet us at the BSSH's account to get more information from whoever's replying on there currently. And if you have time, some time on your hands, why not flip back through previous podcasts if you're a cricket fan? which include Richard Parry talking about South African cricket and I was actually in the pub with Richard last night and he's writing a fantastic new book about um, English tours to South Africa in the 20th century. Uh, you can also catch up with our conference keynote speaker Prashant Kadambi talking about Indian cricket with me um, as well as being shortlisted for the Wolfson Prize Prashant's book Cricket Country has been just been shortlisted for the BSSH's prestigious Lord Aberdare Prize for Sporting Literature and indeed as we heard for the Cricket Society's own Book of the Year Prize. Um, but for now and for this episode it's goodbye from both of us. Goodbye. Goodbye.